We are live. Great. Welcome to the AI argument. AI argument. That's harder to say than I realized. <laughs> this is Justin Collery. I'm Frank Prendergast. And uh, we've just been t t talking about what a crazy time it's been in AI. I a lot think going on this week, Frank. It's mental. Should we should we start with the big one? Should we start with uh, Musk, Elon Musk, and his case against OpenAI? Fascinating. So for people that may not have seen this news yet, because it only broke this morning, um, Elon Musk is suing OpenAI. Uh, and he's suing OpenAI saying that they it's a breach of contract and a breach of trust. Um, so uh, as you might know, uh, OpenAI was set up first open, the clue is in the name, uh, to create open source AI software uh, with the goal of creating AGI. And there's really interesting um, economic incentives um for that company uh, because as soon as they achieve agi they cease to be a company the company gets wound up and the software then gets released for the good of humanity so anybody and everybody can use it and to my mind that means that agi will never be achieved internally it will always just be six months away because they've got an awful lot of money that they need to pay back to microsoft so I mean, it's very I, yeah, interesting I wasn't, I wasn't aware i actually wasn't aware of that i knew about the do you know create AGI for the good of humanity? But I thought that was like a mission statement. I didn't realize that there was kind of very, very specific uh, measures attached to it when it happens. Um, well, now, and that's a good point that you raised there because this is now going to go to court. And AGI, if you were, if I was to bring you back ten years ago and tell you that, um, uh, if I was to bring you back ten years ago and show you ChatGPT four. And I was to ask you, is that AGI? You'd be like, wow, that is most definitely AGI. But as we get closer and closer to what really is AGI, the goalposts seem to keep moving and it's getting harder and harder to say, yes, that's AGI, that's AGI. And what we now end up with is it may well be that a court is going to give us an exact framework of what constitutes AD AGI. And that'd be very interesting to see uh, what a court sees as AGI and what it doesn't see as AGI. That will that will be interesting. And so yeah, so like Elon Musk is saying, GPT-4 is an early version of AGI. And so AGI has been specifically excluded from the Microsoft deal. Um, and so he's saying that this is a, a major breach of, of, of uh, trust and of, well, of, yeah. Breach of contract. Because, yeah. So do you... Do you act? Do you think GPT four is? Do you think it is an early form of AGI? I do, I, I do. I think it's an early. It's not AGI clearly, but it's an early source of AGI. Sorry now, um, it's an early source of AGI, and I, I think for sure that AGI or something close to AGI has been achieved internally, um, within um, OpenAI. I think that's if you look at you mean everything potentially that's like apart from G, apart from GPT four or something else that that's that's in the basement somewhere. Yes. I mean, th th that thing that everybody, I mean, it's a sort of a meme on, on X and Twitter these days, which is what did Ilya see? Mm, and yeah. I look at what's going on in OpenAI, right? So Ilya, I mean, where is Ilya? We haven't seen him. As far as I know, he's living in a cabin somewhere, in a wood hut, <laughs> somewhere deep in a forest. I mean, nobody knows where he is. Um, there are a number of high uh, profile employees leaving OpenAI. Uh, almost daily at this point. I see that the the rep just today, the rep for uh, developer interaction again, Adam is his name. He's very active on X. He's left OpenAI just today. Uh, we had wow. what was the name? What was the name of the guy that left last week? Um, Andre Carpathy. Yeah. Andre Carpathy. Yeah. Who's a brilliant, by the way. If you're interested in this and you want to learn more about it, go watch his videos on YouTube. They're absolutely incredible. Do you think so, there's like do you think there's serious like arguments going on in within OpenAI around this kind of stuff, or do you think everyone just wants to leave to become their own Sam Altman? I, I wonder. I don't know, right? Of course, we're speculating, yeah. but I wonder yeah. is is it from, uh, from certainly from the senior tech people, right? If the goal of the company was to create AGI, and you could see that AGI had either been created already or mm. the path was so clear that it was going to take six or twelve months to do it, you know, maybe you're going. Well, my work here is done. There's there's no need for me here anymore. I'm just going to go and enjoy my life, which is what I want to do when you know AGI comes along and somewhere between here and next Christmas. 
And that's going to be a good thing, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about that because that's the other thing about that about that case is that, um, okay, let me see. I think I pulled out a quote here somewhere. So it says, you know, in, in the um, filing or whatever it's called, like it says, Mr. Musk has long recognized that AGI poses a grave threat to humanity, perhaps the greatest existential threat we face today. And then it goes on later to talk about how, you know, th those opinions were were and possibly are shared by by Sam Altman. And there's a quote from Sam Altman um, saying that uh, the development of superhuman machine intelligence, SMI, probably the greatest threat to the continued existence of humanity. There are other threats that I think are more certain to happen, but are unlikely to destroy every human in the universe the way that SMI could. Yeah. What are you worried about? <laughs> <laughs> the key part of what was said there was there mm. are other things which are certain to happen but you're yeah. worried about something i mean what is it that you're worried about you're clearly in the same camp as elon musk so what is it that worries you i i don't know I, i'm not going to put myself in a camp with elon musk <laughs> I heard but, you're great buddies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I do, yes, I do think that there are risks. Um, and unfortunately, you know, I have no way to assess them. I'm um, like, as far as I'm concerned, if, you know, I, I, I'm, not the, I'm not the biggest fan of Elon Musk. I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of any of them. But, you know, if people like Sam Altman... And, you know, if the people at the very, very, very forefront of this technology can't agree and aren't sure, but generally speaking, all feel that there is some level of total existential threat, then yes, that worries me. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm. I mean, I think that we've every technology has some sort of a threat, and I don't think this every is any different. Technology. Every technology, yeah, every technology. I mean, I think that you know, when the first motor car was invented, they made guys stand in front of it with a red flag because they were worried about the danger that it posed. Um, every time you get into an airplane, do you really understand how the airplane works and what the risks are? You don't. No, and that worries me every time I get in an airplane too. But we can Especially talk about that some other time. <laughs> <laughs> Fly Airbus. <laughs> Ryan Anderson is here with us and uh, wishing us a happy Friday. So thanks, Hi, Ryan. Ryan. Glad to have you here. I um, hope you're enjoying this uh, happy Friday chat about existential <laughs> threats. Friday wouldn't be complete without considering <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> uh, you are clearly not at all concerned then. Like no. not at all? No, at not at all. No, not at all, because I think what we do is we always deal with risks as they happen. So I'm going to give you a good example of how that happens in the world of AI. So one of the risks that you have with AI is around, I can clone, in fact, you've cloned your own voice, right? So I can clone Frank Prendergast's voice. And there was this issue where they had, they had cloned, um, uh, it wasn't Donald Trump's voice, it was... Um, it was what's the it was the other uh, the they had cloned anyway politicians voice and they were doing bot calls so they were calling oh, people yeah, saying the, the, it was joe biden was it joe biden, joe biden people... correct <clears throat> yes so they cloned joe biden's voice and he was ringing people saying here listen don't go out and vote today we need you to save your vote for yeah. the election come october right so that's clearly a problem right and you could imagine that yeah. was to me that was actually quite a a, a low tech version of what could happen in the future, right? I can totally see that there's risks around that. But the FEC came out, or the SE, they, they've banned it. It's now become illegal, right? So it's now illegal to right. do that in the future. And that's how regulation works. So you develop the technology. It gets to a certain point. When you see that there's an issue, it's whack-a-mole. And you 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 then ban it. And that's, that's the correct way. And I would put it to you, right, that you can't exactly put your finger on the bad thing that's going to happen before it happens. It's the bogeyman that's under your bed. But yeah. I can certainly point to good things that will absolutely happen as a result of this technology. So this week alone, this week alone, uh, a research group in the UK have used uh, AI, and they say it's generative AI, uh, to help identify new forms of prostate cancer, which could save, I mean, potentially, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, people my age and older 
um, and possibly you too, Frank, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. <laughs> There's a big getter of people like us. Yeah. Um, so that's a great thing. In uh, There was another as well, some open source software. So software that had been generated by OpenAI about three or four years ago, they had open sourced it and it was used uh, to help predict the movement in fusion uh, reactors. And it's a new way to control them, which is clean, free energy almost for everybody once it gets developed. So these are absolute certainties and they are positives which has been given to us by generative AI and AI in general. And when you stack that up against the bogeyman under the bed and you can't really tell me, you know, what could go wrong. Well, then my view is, yes, there's risks. I acknowledge that there's risks mm. and we deal with them as they come. But there's a whole lot of good stuff and I want to see the goodies. <laughs> I want You know, give me the good stuff yeah. before you go I telling mean, me don't do that. I don't like fun police, Frank. I'm, I mean, I'm torn. I'm torn <laughs> because I absolutely agree with you like the amazing things that ai makes possible i mean it's just incredible i mean the the, the, the two you mentioned are amazing i've you know read about things like um ai being used to figure out animal communication so yeah. you know i mean just phenomenal stuff but i hear what you're saying about the way that we handle risk but that's I kind of feel like that's a historical way of handling risk for like I think I think the only thing that I can think of that is in any way kind of re relatable to AI would be like something like the Manhattan Manhattan project and I know that's used a lot but like I I think most other technologies you know the car can only hit one person at a time or you know the car can only hit a few people at a time um <laughs> Whereas AI, you know, the, the the existential threat is that it could potentially just get rid of all of us in, in a blink, in which case there is no comeback from that. There is no opportunity for us to say, oh, wait, that was a problem. Let's go back. Let's yeah. uh, let's fix that. And going back to Elon Musk's case, right, it's very interesting because he's in that camp. Uh, and so what he's saying is, look, at AGI has been achieved and therefore the software should be released so that everybody can use it and it's for the good of humanity. Now, part of me says that if I want to control the risk of AI, having a closed source and having a company like Microsoft and Amazon and OpenAI and Anthropic and these people who can just turn it off at the flick of a switch, I mean, that seems like a fairly good way, certainly at the start of when we're rolling out the technology. I mean, how do you stop? How do you stop a bad guy with AGI? Two good guys with bigger and better AGIs, Frank. <laughs> <That's my attitude>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, it, you know, in all seriousness, right, having it controlled, having some central control yeah. over it at the start, at least, you can't stop yeah. it. It's, look, in three years, you're going to have an AI that's as capable as GPT-4 on your phone. That is without doubt. That will happen. Yeah. Right. It's baked in. And I do have a concern that when it's so private and so personal, you know, what do people do with it then? You know, their deepest, darkest thoughts, you know, go into that machine. But for right now, it's controlled centrally. I think the mm -hmm. risks are becoming better understood. And I think it's a cultural shift we have to go through. Um, so I'm okay with that. And there's a lot of cultural stuff going on in this area as well this week. Yeah, cultural so, stuff. What are you alluding yeah. to? Well, I, I think the everything that's happening with Google and you know the, the image generation that was oh, going on sure. with Google. Yes. I mean, that's a fascinating, fascinating story as well. Um, and that's you know, I, th I think the risks are cultural uh, more than technical, or you know, it's it's not. It's not that you know AI will wipe us all out in the morning. I, I don't think that's going to happen, but things can happen with AI where we wipe each other out in the morning, right? That's well, you know it can, it can, can yeah. Cause... I think it's. I mean, I think it's like you said. I think there are. So I do think there are existential risks, but I don't know at what percentage those risks are presenting. Um, but in the same way that you said that there are very real, tangible benefits right now, there's also very real, you know, tangible issues right now, as you said, kind of at a at a cultural level, um, one of them, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, uh, like one issue being, you know, people are pointing out that like a lot of the mainstream media are now blocking AI bots from their content. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means that the AIs are being left <laughs> to gather their information from less reputable sources. And who knows, you know, the impact that that's going to have. 
with Google, like, so they, again, for anyone who, who uh, hadn't heard about it, like Google, the, the image generator within Google Gemini clearly had some kind of prompt, like pre-prompt that was trying to ensure that its images would be diverse and would be uh, culturally sensitive, et cetera. But it basically backfired, went completely the, the other way. And when people were asking for images of, you know, Nazis, it was showing a diverse range of people in Nazi uniforms, which of course is, you know, completely inaccurate. And there was loads of examples of this going on and they shut it down. They just, they, they, they removed the ability to create images within Gemini, which you would think sets an interesting precedent. But a friend of mine, Dan Nessel, was interacting with Gemini just with the with the chatbot, and he asked it about the events of October the seventh with the uh, Hamas terrorist attack. And Gemini said that it was that he was talking about a fictitious event, and that there was no proof, and that um, yeah, it was all made up by the media um, and various other. Various other claims like that. That was when that was when he was able to get it to talk about it at all. A lot of the time, it just said, "Go and Google it for yourself." <laughs> um, but the fact that it said, you know, that it said that it it it's supposed to be able to look things up. It's supposed to be able to talk about current events. It's supposed to have access to the web. And here, it's 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 saying something completely outrageous and incorrect. So. Yeah. And like, I think this, I don't, obviously we don't know. And this is the big issue that there's no transparency. Um, they have not shut Gemini down <laughs> in the same way that they shut the, the image generator down. They've run into so many issues. I can't see how they could possibly shut it down because they've run into so many issues. They are just going to be admitting defeat completely if they shut Gemini down. Um, but there's I, no transparency. So the feedback I've heard, Frank, on the, the Gemini model is that it's actually really, really good, really good. So uh, and, and obviously your background is in marketing and it's in, you know, the arts and stuff like that. My background is more technical um, in nature. And what I'm seeing and reading is people putting entire code bases um, into Gemini and then they're using it to, you know, fix bugs and, and stuff like that. And apparently it is brilliant as good if not better than gpt4 and uh, they say that it's an amazing technology so from a technical point of view it's this is really new right no product yeah. no software product ever gets developed and released and is perfect you know day one so it's totally understandable um that there will be some some issues around it now the the, the concerns that i would have right to your, to your point is what cultural sensitivities are we baking into the models that's a big question for me so i yeah. might and my way of thinking about this is, you know, if we had invented this technology in the 70s, we would have embedded 1970s morals into our AI models. So, you know, everybody would have been called Brad. They would have had a mustache as big as yours and would have been drinking cans <laughs> of beer, and, you know, uh, and there yeah. would have been sexist, misogynistic AI bots everywhere running the world. And all that's happening now is we're just baking in the current uh, morals into the AIs. And yeah. in 20 years, people are going to, everybody looks back at 20 years before or 30 years before and go, oh my God, those people were animals. How could they have thought that? And for sure, 20 or 30 yeah. years from now, people are going to look at us and go, oh my God, Frank and Justin, they were animals. Look at them. But actually what we're doing is we're baking that into our AI models. So when I talk yeah. about culturally the challenge, I think that is a challenge. And I think what, what yeah. Google did was terrible. Um I don't think it's any more terrible than, you know, the protest where they got statues and started dumping them into rivers. It's a very similar type of mindset that says there was um, there was statues in the UK of slave traders and so on. And they were, you know, they oh, were, right, perceived, right, right, they were right. perceived to be, you know, right. there was statues celebrating people that in today's world should not be celebrated at all. And they would get the statues and throw them into the river, right? Which personally, and th these are all personal opinions, but personally, I think it's totally wrong. If you, if you don't agree with it, stick a plaque up and explain why it was wrong. And then people can see both sides of the story and educate themselves and so on. And something in AI needs, needs to be the same because what's going to happen mm. 
uh, in the not distant, it's already happening. I've already talked to people, and and you might be the same, where instead of using Google to search, this is why it's a Google mm. killer, they now go to GPT and they just ask GPT, well, what's this? And if it gets 80% of the questions right, you're going to trust the 20% of questions that are wrong, and you're going to take yeah. those truth. And that's an issue. That's absolutely, I would be concerned about that. It's not an existential issue. It's just a factual issue. No, absolutely. And if, you know, this time, so I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that with Gemini, what's going wrong is this, you know, the, like the way if you can, you, so let's take open AI, mm -hmm. you can access GPT-4 through the API and get like a pure form. But if you're accessing it through chat GPT, the developers have like a pre-prompt baked into chat GPT that gives it a certain kind of um, way of responding to you and a little bit of extra humanity and, and things like that. So I'm assuming what's going wrong here is that the pre-prompt in Gemini is completely messed up. Now, it could be wrong. It could be it could be that the actual training is completely messed up, but I suspect that it's this kind of pre-prompt. They got it so wrong this time that it was really obvious. Yep. But as you say, like if they just get it slightly wrong the next time and it just, you know, Let's just talk about like, you know, the, 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 the left versus right leaning ideologies that we have globally now. Um, if we do end up in a situation where it's mostly closed models of AI and it's Google and it's Meta and it's open AI, and then it just becomes like, well, you know, <laughs> does this one lean slightly left? Does this one lean slightly right? Who's accessing this one? Who's accessing that one? And yeah, it could have, it could have big cultural and societal impacts that way. Totally. And it's it's interesting because this is, uh, we can already see this is the intersection of technology and politics, which isn't something that's really happened in the past. Um, and what's interesting about this particular event is that it was really obvious. It was so obvious. You could see it with your eyes. Um, yeah. It, you know, but the question that you would have to ask yourself is, well, what are the more subtle things that are going on in the background? So when I'm doing a search on Google, and I get my first top 10 results, how have they been manipulated? Because it's much harder yeah. for me to spot that manipulation. Right? I just take it that the first five results are the first most relevant, but maybe yeah. maybe they've manipulated those results to be you know, slightly different because of, again, some sort of political agenda. And again, I go back to the point that you know, if a search result brings you straight to a result to a website, but if I'm getting some text out from an AI mm. model, uh, it can be very hard for me to detect, um, uh, you know, how is that, what sort of ideology, because there shouldn't really be an ideology, but there's ideology in everything. Um, but what ideology has gone to make that? And then we get on to sort of the, the idea of maybe, maybe in the future we need uh, sovereign AIs. So maybe you'll have open AI, but you'll also have Irish AI, you'll have American AI and French AI, because they'll have maybe slightly different takes on what is exactly the yeah. same piece of information yeah i yeah i'd be i'd be very curious to meet our sovereign irish ai <laughs> i would love to know <laughs> what it would be like well i mean obviously it's going to be michael d <laughs> as our fearless leader is going to be the face and voice of our ai um, i mean i i can see that it could happen um if you go back to if you think about france in the 80s I mean, French in the 80s were incredibly nationalistic. I mean, there was laws passed about, you know, all the uh, language had to be French on the radio. The radios had to play so much French music and they were very protective of their, their culture. Um, and again, I go back to this idea of we're baking in the values of today. We're also baking in the culture of today. Um, yeah. And that's an interesting, I mean, even to go back to your thing about, uh, you know, it trolls the internet and it gets you know, all of this news articles. It also, if you think of, you know, pick a country that maybe doesn't have a big internet presence, they don't, they have very little impact on the training data then in the AI. Mm. And if you think that this might be the last sort of big technolo technological leap, well, those, all those cultures get left behind then because they didn't have a big internet presence as the training data was being generated. So again, that's not an existential risk. That's just a, yeah. something that can be fixed. But it does, it does bring us nicely onto the other topic that we wanted to talk about, because if, you know, if we, if, if you're saying, yeah, those countries didn't have a huge, um, internet presence, 
what might be needed is for uh, a more rounded worldview for AI to be able to, to gather its own rounded worldview, which it could potentially do through robots who can video and, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, see and hear what's around them. You could have a bit, a bit like Google sends those uh, trucks around videoing for, for street view. We could have robots wandering the earth, um, understanding different cultures, different ideologies. Uh, and it looks like we might not be quite so far away from that as we thought we were. Um, you sent me a link to one of the latest developments what was the name? Yes. What was the name so of the robot? Figure.ai is the name of the company. And just yesterday, they, $275 million uh, was invested into them by uh, OpenAI, Microsoft, and Jeff Bezos uh, were the, the leaders of that. Um, and that's, I mean, Frank, I don't know what you're worried about in this one. AI controlled <laughs> robots, nothing could possibly go wrong. <laughs> It'll be totally fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, but it's so just to I mean talk a little bit about the technicality of it. So if you look at um Tesla and full self-driving cars, the reason that they have a competitive advantage today and are likely to maintain their competitive advantage into the future is because they have an enormous amount of vehicles on the roads every single day and they're collecting massive amounts of data. And for their latest full self-driving release, all they did was they wrote no software uh, for that latest release of full self-driving. All they did was they played the AI's videos of people driving their cars, and that's how it learned how to drive. Right? That's how they did it. So you that can is imagine. That mind blowing. Yes, and I find it brilliant. I'm, I'm, like, I'm actually really impressed with the companies that Musk creates. You know, when you see that type of technical brilliance behind it, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so. From an open AI point of view, right, as you correctly pointed out, right, that at the moment they trawl the internet and they download as much data as they can. But if you have teams of robots out in the world and those robots are listening and they're seeing and they're touching and they're interacting, the amount of data that that generates is enormous. And in fact, yeah. uh, Jan Lacan, and I totally mispronounced his name, but he's the head of AI for Meta, uh, often talks about the fact that the amount of data that a five-year-old child receives is far more than the amount of data that we currently use to train our AI models. And the reason for that is basically audio and visual information mm. that the child's, all these things that the child is picking up almost subconsciously. Um, and I don't know, do you, do you find that concerning, Frank, that we're going to have robots uh, folding your <laughs> laundry? Well, I mean, you know, I would love to have robots to uh, to do various tasks around the house that I that I have no interest in doing. Like, I've got a huge I've got a huge house clean in front of me this weekend, and if I could have a robot do it, I would be absolutely thrilled. But you know, as you've pointed out, we have seen too many films about how this turns out not to have any worries whatsoever. Um, and I mean, so the the um, the video of the, the the video that went along with that that announcement was of a, a man walking up to that robot that is standing behind the counter with a uh, kind of one of those Keurig coffee makers in front of it. And the man simply walks up to the counter and says, make me a coffee. And the robot has with perfect dexterity takes out one of those tiny little pods and puts it in the machine. Like, you know, we all know how finicky those, those Keurig machines are. <laughs> and this robot does it absolutely perfectly just on a voice command. Um, and I think it said in the post that like, it wasn't, you know, it's not, it wasn't like specifically trained to make coffee. If I understood correctly, it's like. They, they, what they do for a lot of these, and there's a lot of companies working on this, by the way, they're, they're, they are by no means the only company doing this, but what a lot of them are doing, they learn by example. So what they will do is they will film somebody doing a particular action or completing a particular task. And then the robot will copy that afterwards. Um, and then because oh, you're using generative AI, obviously it's it's you know it's not like an old computer program where if it moves slightly this way or that way, it won't get it in. Like I think you've seen maybe some of the videos where it takes two or three goes for it to get the pod into the coffee pod machine, but it sticks right. at it and it actually does it. Um, so it's incredible. But I will say I'll give you the reason why I'm not worried about this. Uh, fact, maybe to help you sleep better over the weekend, um, is. They, you know, AIs don't have intent, right? They don't have anything Yet. except for what we ask them to do. So, Yet. well, there's no nothing. Yes, okay. And if they develop intent, well, then we'll deal with it. But right now, they don't have intent, right? All they do is they do what you ask them to do. 
Yeah, but okay. So there, there's so there's the yet question in terms of you know people we're we're striving for AGI. Um, Elon Musk thinks we're there already, <laughs> and that <laughs> and that this is a, a financial con by OpenAI that they're not admitting it. Um, and the next step up from AGI is you know this super intelligence. It'll happen and in the next time. That, yeah. So. And wait, you think it'll happen in the, in the next decade and you're still not worried? Like you're still saying, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. The robots just do what we ask them to. But not if they have super intelligence. But also, <laughs> super intelligence aside, I mean, humans make loads of mistakes. Could we not just end up like with some bad programming that has disastrous <laughs> effects? Could we not like could we not accidentally program the robot to do the opposite of what we tell it to? And with, then we tell it not to kill anybody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> we 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 could and we'll deal with it when that happens. I mean, we look at I work, uh, in software, <laughs> I work in the software industry. Mistakes happen all the time. I mean, you don't want to know. You don't want to know how the sausage is made, Frank. And the less you know about the software that controls your life, probably the better you'll sleep at night. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'm 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 sure you know. I'm sure. In software, generally speaking, it's it you know the, the the issues that that are being resolved are not oh dear it wiped out wiped out half of the team. <laughs> it might feel like that to some poor long suffering software engineers. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess well we're actually at time, but let's just finish on this one last point because it does kind of tie in because the, the I remember last year seeing a. Uh, it was a, a construction site, and you know those tarps that they put down over the building while they're working on it. And the tarp said, um, "Chat, hey, ChatGPT, finish this building." And then underneath that, it said something like, "Your skills are irreplaceable." And it was, it was, but you know, a, a massive ad for the construction company doing the building. And I saw it, and I was like, "Hmm, have you know, have they not heard about Boston Dynamics and the incredible robots that that they have uh, already built?" And are just waiting for AI to be put into them. Um, and so the one of the other topics that we were going to talk about today was uh, the company who have, I've forgotten the name, begins with K, replaced like 700 jobs with AI in customer support. The company's name was Klarna. Klarna, um, yes. Klarna was the company that came back. And what they've done is they've released, uh, they've basically yeah got rid of 700 support staff um, and replace them with AI. And, and again, right, I would point, and I know we're at time, and we'll come back to this, but those were 700 jobs that weren't good for people, right? I mean, it's, this is like getting rid of 700 coal mining jobs, right? It's bad, yeah. for, their health, bad for their physical health. And it, there's a huge customer surplus because you get faster, better customer service. So I think yeah. this is a total net win. Although I can see that people or, might say, oh, it's you know, we're losing 700 jobs. We're not. You know, it's everybody no, wins. But no, but and this is why I tied it into the robots because it's seven hundred jobs right now because Klarna acted, in my opinion, probably maybe a little bit too quickly. They're but they brave. acted quickly, so it's seven hundred jobs. It's making the headlines, but like these are not they, these are not going to be the only seven hundred jobs affected or lost, and that's at something like customer support right now, where AI can can right now quite easily do it. But now we're looking at putting AI into robots. The construction company that thought it was perfectly safe last year is no longer looking very safe. Those 700 jobs, like that is just going to, that's going to be a domino effect. And it's going to be across how many industries, how many skill sets, how many levels. And, you know, the question then becomes like, what do those people do? And not what do they do? Because as far as I'm concerned, AI can have my job. AI can... I'd be delighted. Take it. Lovely. But how do I pay my rent? And how do I pay for my groceries? So maybe maybe that's a question we'll come back to <laughs> the next time we maybe meet we up. Maybe we will. And, and I'll, I'll just finish and say that I think I, I hear your concern, but I think I, I sort of I think of this period as kind of the difficult teenage years. So society has to go through this transition. And I think the end state is good. And I think the start state where we are now is good. But the bit in the middle is going to be challenging. And, you know, it's 700 mm. um, jobs in a call center that have been lost today. But tomorrow it's going to be 700 programming jobs, you know, and they're going to be well-paid jobs. And that's when it's really going to start hitting the headlines. Um, and maybe that process needs to be managed. I mean, just think about it. And we should have a chat about how you might do that some other time. 
Sounds good. Amazing. Brilliant. This has been a pleasure um, and terrifying and fascinating. <laughs> and, uh, Frank, hopefully you sleep I, a little bit better this weekend. <laughs> I, I I don't think so, Justin. <laughs> I think we've gone the other way. <laughs> Great. Brilliant. Okay. I, will, uh, I will chat to you again next week. Talk to you next week. Cheers.